Hello, um, so we are from Boston Children's Museum. Uh, my name is Saki, and I will let my colleague introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Dieso. So we are going to be talking about our approaches on following child's lead when we are, um, we are leading the uh, STEAM programs at the museum. I think we can just have our slides up at this point. Perfect. And then the next slide is, hold on. Yeah, this is just our intro. We already introduced ourselves, but I am the Senior Educator of Child Development and Accessibility. I am an Asian woman uh, with typically wearing sunglasses uh, <laughs> because I am legally blind. Uh, so the myself on the screen right now without sunglasses are actually very rare look um, of myself. Um, and then Michelle um, is a director of STEAM. I am not able to describe herself. Sorry, we should have done that at our intro, but I think we'll just kind of skip that part. Sorry about that. And we can just go to our next slide. So before we talk about our approach, particularly in uh, our STEAM programs, I want to talk a little bit about our museum just as a whole. So we are considered as informal learning environment as opposed to formal learning environment. So you can think of formal environment as your like a very stereotypical school, but as an informal learning environment, we believe that uh, children can lead their experience in learning, and we encourage uh, kids to follow their passion and interest. And we typically serve um, kids from zero to 10, um, although our average age range is about like four and five. Uh, that's probably our biggest audience. And then kids cannot come to the museum on their own. Even if some people try <laughs> to drop their kids off at the museum, that's not allowed. So actually half of our visitors are adults who come with the, their children and they're very important members um, of our audience as well. And especially since the pandemic, we've been trying to go beyond um, our museum walls. Um, to really deliver the type of experience that they would have in the museum to the community and home and school and other types of environment as well. And we can go to, oh, perfect. Um, so if you can see, uh, these are the picture um, of different um, aspects of the museum, I guess. And to those who need access to all text, it's provided in the slides themselves. But the point of this slide is really to showcase that we have a range of different programs. We might be doing more like a science-y thing with like bubbles, or we might have more cultural activities with our Japanese house exhibit, which is an authentic uh, like 150-year-old house from Kyoto, Japan. Or we might have a um, exhibit specifically focusing on the development of kids from like zero to three, because we know that the brain development, like the ninety percent of the develop brain development, happens at those ages. Or you know, we might do something like building. Um, we might also do some like arts, and we also have this giant climbing structures. Um, that starts from our lobby and then goes all the way up to the third floor of the museum. So it's quite massive. And, you know, some kids and adults can be a little bit nervous and that's actually okay. So that's also a different types of like risks that they can take. Although the climbing structure, of course, is very safe, um, but we encourage a little bit of a risk taking and facing your fear. Um, that's just kind of another thing that we do. But as you can see, we don't focus on a theme or subject, I guess, um, because as a children's museum, we exist for the sake of children, not necessarily just for the sake of art, like art museums, or for the sake of history, like history museums. So really, our focus is on the kids themselves, and we use different means to um, sort of um, help them learn and develop uh, through different experience. Next slide. Perfect. 
Um, so our experience at the museum is guided by what we call the learning framework at the museum. And it talks about how play and exploration leads to learning and how learning feeds back into the exploration and play. Now, if I talk about what is play and what is exploration and what's learning, it actually will probably take a whole semester, <laughs> you know, college semester. Uh, so I am not going to get in there necessarily, but just as a way to explain it a little bit, I like to use this example where you can imagine just like a group of kids wandering into a space somehow, don't ask me why, <laughs> with like that it's like filled with cardboard boxes, for example. There are no adults around them. This is not the US. <laughs> um, you can, you, there's no one that's there that's telling them like what to do or what not to do. So, you know, some kids might naturally start to build with it or some kid might like try to like make some instrument, may, might, you know, might use the box as a drum or some kid might make a pretend kitchen or restaurant and start selling pretend ice cream. So they might start doing different things on their own. And that's sort of like what we mean by play. Play is something that kids do because they are intrinsically motivated to do so. That's something that they are choosing freely. Now, while they're playing, they might think about, what if I put this giant box on top of this tiny little box? What if I did that? Or what if I whack this box with a metal tool? Or what happens if I use like a wood stick? Would that make a difference? Or the kid next to me is using a very interesting tool. I want to use that too. What if I snatch it out of her hand? Like what would happen? So they're just constantly working through these like what ifs. And that's kind of like what we mean by exploration. Now, while they are experimenting with it, they might learn that it's not very well balanced if a big box is on top of a little box. Or if you steal a toy or tool from another child, oh, he or she started to cry. Maybe not a good idea. So they are learning um, how the world works, which can be a physical phenomena, or it can be a social dynamic or cultural sense, like whatever it is. Through play and exploration, they are learning how things work. So you might also notice that by learning, we aren't necessarily talking about like gaining knowledge or getting specific ideas. It's not necessarily about being able to count from like one to a hundred or, you know, being able to cite all their ABCs, naming all the colors, that sort of a thing, which can of course be important, but I think we are focusing more on building skills um, that help them in the end, learn those subject matters, if that makes sense. Next slide. All right. Um, and as I said that adults are important audience um, of the museum and we want to communicate what basically what I just communicated to you about how we view learning and how we can all support kids as adults. And we have this wheel called um, STEAM Habits of Mind, um, which talks about different skill sets like being curious or and problem solving, that kind of things. And then we have, when we do programs, like maybe even with like babies, because adults don't necessarily put babies or toddlers, you know, to STEM learning. Uh, we actually try to showcase how little kids can actually learn and start to develop those like a foundational, like a STEM or STEAM skills. And so when we are doing our programs, um, we might try to put some focuses on how kids are using different tools or methods, you know, like, oh, your kid is using spoons and spatula and forks and like whatever is provided in interesting ways. Or some kids really just want to watch first. And adults can get a little nervous of that sometimes, like my kid is just not doing anything. But we try to reassure them that it is okay to watch um, first. Or some kids love to repeat things. And again, sometimes adults have a trouble with it because it can be a little boring and rep too repetitive for 
the adults, um, but we actually try to highlight that there's a lot of importance uh, to little kids um, doing that. Or, you know, kids might make some like fun discoveries and I really love to encounter those moments myself. Um, or even babies can invite others to engage. Like they might be doing something and they just kind of look at the adults. It's like, look what I just did. So like those moments are also something that we highlight. Again, just keep repeating myself, but not necessarily the fact that your kid was able to name this object or anything like that. It's more of those everyday moments that we actually want to showcase and highlight as a way of developing um, their learning and STEAM habits of minds. Now I will pass the mic on to Misha. Great, thank you so much, Saki. Um, I'm Michelle Dieso. I'm the Senior Director of STEAM at Boston Children's Museum. I am a white woman in my upper 30s and I have long dark hair. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so our slides just went back up. Um, and we actually, as with everything in the museum, are going to jump in and get your hands on things. Hopefully, we are going to invite you to do a little activity with us on the spot right now. Um, so I'm going to first ask that you look around wherever you are and gather a few items from where you are. It could be things like paper, paper clips, binder clips, post-its, scissors, a pen. It could even just be a uh, paper and a writing implement if you if that's what you have around you. Um, in the picture on the slide, I posted the items that I found when I did this activity. So I had a piece of paper, a post-it note, uh, rubber bands, a binder clip, some paper clips, a pen, and a little bit of tape. So I'm gonna give everyone a few seconds if you can look around you and gather a few items you might use in our little activity. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so here is my challenge for all of you who are taking part today. I would like you to make a playground for a fish. And here we have an image of a fish <laughs> that I made on the screen. Um, that is the fish we were thinking of. So I'm gonna give everyone five minutes to build and use the materials that you found around you. And I am gonna put it my timer on starting now. I apologize for the lack of music. <laughs> you can sing in your head.
We have about two more minutes. All right, I'm going to give everyone about 10 more seconds to wrap up. It's okay if you didn't finish. You are welcome to finish your design after the session as well. Okay, next slide. All right, so you were asked to make a playground for a fish, and I really wish I could see all of the designs. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions and invite um, anybody who is interested to share in the chat, and Stemi is going to help us uh, do a little back and forth with that. Um, so I'd like you all just to do a little reflection and notice what you just did. So when you heard the prompts, make a playground for a fish, what did you think about first? And then as you were designing, what did you do or what did you change as you were going? So I invite you to, you can just think about this in your own mind or you are welcome to add your thoughts into the chat. Michelle. Mm -hmm. We had someone say their first thought was, how would a fish play? Ooh, great question. I imagine if we asked a room full of people, a lot of people might have different ideas of what that looks like. Someone else said, I thought about what fish do in their tanks and when they looked happy. Ooh, okay. I would be really curious to know how we know a fish is happy. <laughs> But I like that idea of thinking about something that you might have seen and observed yourself. So using that real life experience to then pull that image of that fish into your into your design. We did have somebody uh, state from Justine that uh, mine looks like a mini circus and said that the positive note is that the fish can explore. And someone else just added that they created tubes that they thought the swim that the fish could swim through. Ooh, tubes. That's a great idea. They could go in sometimes fish like little hiding places or nooks. But that could be a fun idea for them to shoot through. And we just got one more where someone's first thought was how um, I thought about how I could incorporate plants and obstacles to hide. Um, and someone else set up their pens and pencils like there were coral that they mm. could play hide and seek in. Oh, awesome. I love the idea of fish hide and seek. 
Uh, I love every the ideas people are sharing. I see that Natalie also created tubes, so there are some similar structures that we're starting to see for some of the designs. Um, and this idea of maybe some obstacles, things they can play in, maybe hide in. Wonderful. I really appreciate everyone sharing their ideas and their designs. Um, so what we've seen and what I love about this prompt and this challenge so much is that we see that everybody has the same stakeholder in mind. In this case, it is a fish or maybe a school of fish. Um, you had to think about maybe what they might like, what they might enjoy, where they live, what is around them. So maybe you thought about those plants that might already be in the area where they live and how you could incorporate that into your design. Um, you also might have tried using materials in a different way. I'll show some examples from our site. Um, you might have used some different tools as you were designing. Um, and we didn't have a lot of opportunity to share, but I really appreciate everyone who did share out um, and communicating and sharing your idea and what you went through is also a really amazing skill and part of why we do what we do. We can go to the next slide. So I'm going to show a couple examples on this slide and the next from visitors and staff. So in this slide on the left hand picture, we have a um, image of a playground for a fish. It is actually a zip line. A visitor made this in our steam lab. Um, and there's two small pieces of straw that are taped down to a piece of paper and they used a little mini bottle cap and some pipe cleaners the fish can zoom right across that zip line. Um, and on the right, you see my own design. So you saw my original materials in the previous slide. Um, for my design, I actually also only gave myself five minutes. It was very challenging. So I recognize that if you have a few struggles with the time, I did as well. Um, I really wanted to make a slide and it was very important that the slide was curvy. So I had a really hard time getting that curve into my slide, uh, especially because my tape, I had much less tape than I thought. So I had to be really careful about um, how to use it. But I was able to make a curvy slide. Um, and I did want to make a swing, but then I thought a fish might have trouble sitting on a swing, um, just given their body and what that was like. So I went, ended up going with a type of monkey bar instead. So I kind of changed my design as I kept thinking through. First, I thought about what do I really love at a playground? And then I had to pause and think about what would a fish really like? And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, here are two more examples from other staff members who I, I gave this wonderful task of designing a playground for a fish. Um, the image on the left is the staff member had a piece of paper and pen. Uh, the pen happened to have a fish on it, so he incorporated that in his design. Um, but he drew a picture of a slide, so we see kind of some connection there between interest in slides for fish. Um, and then uh, he used the little, the pieces actually on the upper side is showing the sun, so we see more of the whole scene of the playground. On the right side, we see the materials that the other staff member used, which was a mix of headphones, paper clips, sticky notes, a golf tee, and a napkin. So some unusual pieces in there, but we work at an unusual fun place. Um, and so her design you see on the bottom where the, um, the headphones create the fishbowl and the image, the other pieces are inside of that fishbowl. So the golf tee is a pole that they can slide down, kind of similar to a slide. Um, and the paper clips is actually a musical installation, so it makes noises as they go by it. Um, so you can see from these designs in relation to what you created and what you all shared is even with a very simple prompt and very simple materials, there's a lot of creativity and a lot of amazing imagination that comes out of it. All right, I'm actually gonna switch back to Saki to give another example. Thank you, everyone.
thank you. I now really want to see fish just like using the slides. It, I just had this like image in my head that was really funny. <laughs> Um, but anyway, that was, I think, one of the examples of how we do our programs where we might have a prompt, but there's really no right or wrong, right? Uh, there is no like, oh, you didn't think about this or you're wrong in thinking about this. Like anything that kids can notice and do, it's fine. Um, and uh, we might actually get inspired uh, with each other as well and have the different ideas. So I want to now highlight uh, three more examples of different ways um, that we utilize our sort of open-ended approach um, in our programs. Uh, the one on the slide currently uh, is an example from our STEAM Sprouts program where we do uh, STEAM or STEM activities for kids um, primarily um, from zero to three. So very young kids and showcase to adults like what STEM or STEAM uh, can look like for even like babies and toddlers. So for this type of program, we do a lot of like a material exploration and this um, example is cups. So we just have a bunch of like cups out, like paper cups, some plastic, different sizes maybe, but we don't necessarily tell them what to do with the cup. We don't even say, come build with the cups. We just say, here are the cups, go at it. <laughs> and a lot of adults immediately start making pyramids, right? Put the cups upside down and then make the structure that looks like a pyramid. And that's sort of like how many adults think of it as the correct way of doing this activity. But kids, they do all sorts of things. They like to nestle them, they like to roll, they might tap things, they wanna throw them, they wanna squish them. They're doing all sorts of things. And for the staff, we want to model all of those behaviors ourselves. And we really want to validate all those different ways that kids are playing uh, and exploring um, with the cups. Now, we don't necessarily want to tell the adults either that they're thinking it's incorrect uh, or shame the way that they are trying to support their kids. However, we just kind of do our best in a sort of gentle, non-preachy uh, sort of way um, to help adults understand that what kids are doing now is actually interesting and then if we just let them take their time it actually is going to lead to something interesting like in this picture one of them this kid basically like nestled all the cups and it got so long but he was like very proud that it got taller than him it's very unstable <laughs> but he's like holding it so it it won't like fall down of course in the beginning you know, there are some adults that are telling him that he's like doing it so-called wrong. Uh, in order to make it tall, you kind of want to, again, put them like upside down and then make them like a tower. And he basically just didn't nestle them, like kept nestled, nestling, nesting them, I guess, um, and then made them tall. But it actually did end up, um, you know, as, as uh, doing something like interesting uh, for him to explore. So we really don't want to create too many prompts, too many right or wrong sort of thing and just say, go at it and then help adults kind of see the value in that as well. And the next example, actually, Michelle has to talk about it. Great, thank you, Saki. All right, our next example does actually use a prompt, but we wanted to give you another view of one of the ways we set up activities. Um, so this activity, you are designing a space tool. Um, so you are on a new planet. You need to design a tool to pick up a rock from the planet and put it in the lab without touching it, because we don't know if we can touch these materials safely. Um, so this is what we provide as the prompt and the initial setup. Um, visitors get to see there's a baby pool that's filled with various types of balls. Those are our rocks. There's a table next to it with a small container. That is our lab where they need to drop the ball into when they finish. Um, 
and we then provide various materials for them to choose from. So they might have things like dowels and cardstock, um, tape, spoons, straws, rubber bands, a mix of materials, and we let them go and see what they do. Next slide, please. So we have done this activity actually in the museum many times. We have done it in kindergarten classrooms. Um, it's very fun every time. Um, this slide shows some responses we got from some of our kindergartners after they did the activity. They were excited that they got the rock. Um, and we also have a picture of two kids participating in this activity. Um, so when we set up the activity, the important thing is it's open-ended. We never say we are making a tool. This is what it's going to look like. We give them a very basic prompt and challenge to aim for, and then let them go and see where they're going to take it. When kids are ready and they go to test their designs, there's usually an educator there to talk to them about their designs. And that's where you can really get into learning about their thinking, what they decided for the design, the materials they chose and why. And those conversations are the really fruitful conversations about really diving into what's going on, what were you thinking about? A lot of times as adults, when we see a design, we might have an initial idea of what it is and where it's going. And we find a lot with young children that if we present that to them, then they say, no, that is absolutely not what I was thinking. Instead, I was thinking this. Um, and it's so we like to leave and lead with open ended questions about tell me about your design and invite them in to see um, to see what they can tell us and then kind of let them guide it from there. Um, So combining all of that, it lets us leave, have the child lead where they're excited about. So maybe they're just really excited about testing their same design six different times. Maybe they're really excited about trying out different materials and they come back multiple times with very different designs. Um, or they really want to perfect their design. Some kids we have stay at this activity for maybe even a half hour, just going back and forth doing small tweaks, coming back, doing another tweak, coming back. Um, and so with that kind of open-ended challenge and really letting the educator kind of guide based on where the child is excited and what they're very drawn to, um, we really get an opportunity to really see their creativity grow. I'm gonna pass it back to Saki for one more example. All right, so I have one last quick example of a program where there might be actually a little bit of a knowledge <laughs> that we are trying to give to some kids, even if we don't do that too often. Uh, so in this example, we have this human skeleton puzzle. Um, however, we don't necessarily say that these are human skeleton or like make human or anything like that. It's just kind of obvious to adults and most kids um, that these are human skeleton. Now, if we let them just kind of put them together, they naturally, again, often make humans, but just like this kid in the picture where he put the arms basically like on the head, maybe some legs on where the arms go, he just kind of put them together in a funny way. Now, he might be being silly, but we don't necessarily tell him that it's wrong, it's not a human. Uh, we can actually just go with it. And that's the benefit of us not saying that you have to make a human skeleton. This is just like bare bones, do something. Um, so, but it does not mean that there's no lessons or learning that, or knowledge that he took out of it. We can still have a conversation with this child. Like, what would a creature look like if there are bones like this on the head? Do we have something like that on our head? Maybe you don't. But what would that feel like? Um, maybe we can draw an animal or creature that could look like this when they have a skeleton structure like that in their body. So there are actually still a lot of ways, even if you might have a more sort of a specific knowledge or learning goals that you're aiming for, to make it still open-ended and then make it um, more of a child-directed experience without teachers or us staff 
necessarily telling them what to do. And that's the end of our slides.